In March of 1882, construction began on what would one day become one of the most famous churches in the world, but little did the original architect know when he first designed the building that 140 years later, the church would still be under construction. From Notre Dame in Paris to St. Peter's in Rome, churches make up some of the most architecturally impressive buildings in the world, so it's not surprising that many of them do take a while to construct. But even with all of your standard expected construction delays, how in the world does one single project take 140 years to build? Well, the answer to that question is complicated, but the subject of today's episode, which is known as the Sagrada Familia, is nearing completion as of the filming of this video. And let's just put it this way, 140 years is a long time, but I think you'll agree it was worth the wait. Even with the Sagrada Familia not being 100% completed yet, it has been a tourist attraction for years with over 250,000 visitors writing reviews, raving about the incredible architecture, the elaborate designs, one recent visitor even said that this place is straight up the most beautiful place that she's ever been to. So yeah, thankfully what that means is that we've got a bunch of photos and videos that we can kind of sift through as we move about today's episode and we figure out why this building has been under construction for so long and what even was the original architect's vision here. The Sagrada Familia is located in Barcelona, Spain, a region that's famous for a lot, but particularly famous for its mix of modern and Gothic architecture there's so much of this church that I want to show you guys. It is seriously a wild work of art. But before we do that, I just want to talk about the brains behind this building, and that is a guy named Antony Gaudi. Gaudi was the architect behind the Sagrada Familia, but he wasn't just an architect. He was an artist and a visionary who single-handedly designed this building into what it is today. Born in 1852, Gaudi was influenced by his father, who was a coppersmith. That's what gave him kind of an appreciation for craftsmanship at such a young age. He eventually went on to study architecture at this school right here, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Right out of college, Gaudi started designing some buildings that showcased his signature style of vibrant colors, intricate tile work, and organic forms that were inspired by nature. And his reputation grew pretty quick, which led him to take on bigger and more ambitious projects in no time. Now, one thing that's interesting is that Antony Gaudi is credited with being the architect who designed the Sagrada Familia and he definitely is the guy, but he actually was not the church's first pick. Initially, the project was designed by another architect named Francisco de Paula del Villar. He put together a pretty elaborate plan in the beginning for what he wanted the church to look like, but after some disagreements that he had with the church, Antony Gaudi took over the design only one year after the project was initially designed. This all happened in 1883, and when Gaudi took over the project, it would quite literally dominate the rest of his life. Gaudi poured his heart and soul into this project. He said his goal was for the building to tell the story of Christ through his architecture, and he would spend the next 40 years of his life working on this church. He actually moved into the church during the later part of his life just to kind of fully immerse himself in the construction. Gaudi never married, he never had any children, and by the end of his life, he even started to let his hygiene go as he just obsessed about completing the Sagrada Familia. Apparently he wore shabby ragged clothing, he stopped shaving completely, and he only ate lettuce dipped in milk for his typical lunch. But in June of 1926, during one of Gaudi's morning walks to confession, he was sadly hit by a tram at the age of 73. Now back to the church. This place was made up of kind of five key areas, starting with three facades. We've got the nativity facade, the passion facade, and the glory facade. It's got 18 spires, or it will have 18 spires once it's completed, and each one of them symbolizes a different religious figure. Then last, there's the interior, which is another world in and of itself. The nativity facade was the first part of the Sagrada Familia to be completed and Gaudi's Catholic faith definitely shines in every detail here. The facade is dedicated to the birth of Jesus. It's got a bunch of intricate sculptures that are depicting scenes from the nativity, and Gaudi's love for nature comes out here too. The nativity facade also has carvings of plants and animals all over it. It is hard to imagine just all of the time and effort that probably went into carving all of that stone. And remember, this is just one facade. You start to kind of realize why this 
project took so long to build. Next up, we have the passion facade, and this view here is actually a pretty sharp contrast from the nativity facade. This one is dedicated to the death of Jesus, and the vibe of the sculptures on this facade have a much more somber theme to them. Then last, we have the glory facade. This one's going to feature a grand staircase plus a bunch more sculptures and inscriptions and columns that are leading up to the main doors. Now, the people who are building the Sagrada Familia aren't necessarily concerned with their return on investments. They're kind of taking their time, but for the rest of us out here who are in the real estate game and who are needing our projects to move along a little bit faster and needing to stay a little bit more organized, the sponsor of today's episode, Baselane, is going to be a huge help. See, real estate investors and property managers are spending a lot of time tracking where all their money is going. And as a real estate investor myself, I can speak firsthand that one of the most overwhelming parts of this business is the accounting. It's a lot. Baselane is a banking platform tailor-made for real estate investors of all sizes. They help investors achieve their financial goals by giving them a clear picture of their finances with an all-in-one platform to do banking, accounting, and property management. So whether you're dealing with one property, five properties, or 20 properties, Baselane's financial tools are gonna help you with your banking, your bookkeeping, and your rent collection. With Baselane, you can automate bookkeeping with unlimited virtual accounts to stay organized. You can create separate accounts for each of your properties, and you can set aside funds for security deposits, vacancy, and maintenance, which is extremely helpful. Then you can tag your expenses automatically to each property, which will save you time when accounting. It only takes a few minutes to open an account with Baselane, and there's no monthly fees or minimum balances required. So yeah, if you own a rental property or you're a property manager, go to baselane.com slash Scott or check out the links down in the description to learn more about how this platform can help you with your rental property finances. Let's get back to the video. Okay, back to the Sagrada Familia. We talked about the facades. Now we need to talk about the spires, which are probably the most striking features of this place from a distance. There's going to be 18 total spires here whenever it's 100% finished. The architect's goal with the spires is that each each one is supposed to represent an important biblical figure, with 12 of the spires dedicated to the apostles, four to the evangelist, one to the Virgin Mary, and then the tallest spire will be dedicated to Jesus. That one is going to reach a height of 565 feet, which will officially make this the tallest church in the world. That's the title that's currently held by a church called the Ulm Minister in Ulm, Germany, which stands 529 feet tall. The spires at Sagrada Familia, even though they're not finished yet, just absolutely dominate the Barcelona skyline. But the thing is, it's not just their height that makes these spires impressive. They also have just as much detail on them as the facades do. Each spire at this church is a work of art topped with symbolism of its own. This outline here on the church's website give us kind of just like a rough timeline on how the Sagrada Familia came to be. We know the foundation was laid and things all kicked off in 1882. The nativity facade was completed by 1930. Unfortunately, this was the only facade that Gaudi was able to see finished because we know he passed away in 1926. The crypt area was also completed during that same window of time. It was finished up in 1923. Facade number two, the passion facade was completed between 1954 and 1976. And we got to think, okay, we're from the 1950s to the 1970s now, which means that the construction methods used to build this church have completely changed from when construction began. A bunch of that intricate interior work started in 1986 and is still being worked on to this day. The glory facade, that's facade number three, is also still being worked on as we speak. And then just a couple years ago in 2021, the Catholic Church officially canonized Antony Gaudi, which is recognition for his extraordinary architectural contributions to the Sagrada Familia. If you didn't know what canonization means, that's okay because I definitely did not know Know what that was canonization is to declare a deceased person an officially recognized saint so that's pretty cool okay now let's talk about the inside of the Sagrada Familia which is just as impressive as the outside it might even be more impressive it's definitely an engineering marvel and let's just put it this way they spared no expense there is a lot going on in 
inside this church. It's pretty mesmerizing. It's almost overwhelming. These columns inside, they kind of resemble trees as they branch out, as they rise, which not only looks awesome, but it actually provides the structural support that's needed to hold up the canopy of the building. Next, you've got these super vibrant stained glass windows. They're great to look at themselves, but what's even better is the kaleidoscope of colors that these windows create as the sun shines through them at different times of day. Then, of course, at the heart of the building, we've got the altar. This is the focal point for sure, and surrounding the altar, there's more sculptures, more carvings, more biblical scenes. When Antony Gaudi passed away, way back in 1926, all the people who took over the project at that time totally could have just been like, you know what, that was a great idea, but it's a little bit too crazy for us. We're never gonna get this thing finished. Let's just scrap that plan and build something way simpler. I mean, when he passed away at that time, the church was literally less than a quarter complete. So it would have been pretty easy to just basically abandon the original plan, but they didn't abandon the original plan. They stuck it out and it's pretty brave of them because check this video out. So this just goes to show how complicated it was to build this thing. This video breaks down those columns that we were talking about earlier that are inside the church and how they kind of go up like a tree and hold the place up. This is how those things were engineered. Look at this. In the late 1800s, a famous architect by the name of Antoni Gaudi used exactly this technique to design the arches of the famous Basilica of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, Spain. To figure out how to shape the arches, he built a precision upside down model of the basilica. His model was like this chain model. It changed shape as he added miniature weights corresponding to the loads of the roof and other features that the arch had to support. The resulting final profile showed him the exact shape to use for each arch. Okay, for one, I think I just realized that I've been pronouncing his name wrong the entire video. I'm pretty sure I've been saying Antony Gaudi and he just said Antoni Gaudi, so Sorry, Mr. Gowdy. But yeah, how he designed the Sagrada Familia is very similar to how bridges are designed. It's a very unique and unusual way of designing a structure like a church, but he wanted to do it that way. He used this string and weight method to try to pull it off, and he did. And the people who moved on to build it after he passed away stuck with a plan and I just love that. The Sagrada Familia might be big and it might be impressive, but what's actually interesting is it is nowhere near the biggest church in the world. This list here shows us the largest churches around, which are ranked by interior and exterior square meters, gross volume, and then of course they look at seating capacity. Believe it or not, the Sagrada Familia ranks 48th on this list with the interior space of about 5,400 square meters and a seating capacity of just 9,000. St. Peter's tops the list with a capacity of 60,000 if guests are standing, making it the largest church in the world by far. Here's the deal though. I don't think that Gaudi was really trying to go for the biggest church in the world here or even the biggest capacity capacity in the world. I also don't think that he was trying to like recreate the Sistine Chapel or Notre Dame. I think what Gaudi was trying to accomplish here is he was just trying to create a beautiful place of worship in his hometown and a work of art, which I think we can all agree he accomplished. Almost 4 million people visit this church every year, making it the most visited monument in all of Spain. And these very visitors paying admission to tour the church and the grounds are the biggest reason why it's been possible to continue building year after year, 140 years after construction on Sagrada Familia began. We don't usually talk about churches here on the channel, but I had fun with this one. I hope you guys did too. What an incredible building. I'll see you next week.